to skeletal muscles, they're going somewhere else in the body. If they're going, we're getting an internet leg. All right, now we should be all cut up. The, the motor nerves of the peripheral nervous system that are part of the autonomic division, that's peripheral nervous system, visceral motor nerves, so innervation to the viscera to regulate your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your digestion, secretion of um, digestive enzymes, how fast in, uh, food moves through your gut, all of that is going to be relayed to those structures via the autonomic nervous system, the autonomic motor peripheral nervous system, that autonomic nervous system. Now, that autonomic nervous system is involuntary, and it's divided into that sympathetic division or that parasympathetic division. Again, sympathetic division is your fight, flight, freeze, and friction. The parasympathetic division is your rest, digest, arousal, and repair. Let's take a closer look. We'll come back to autonomics, um, I think, in our next uh, slide presentation, probably at 11 o'clock this morning. Um, so let's talk real briefly about those spinal nerves. We've seen all of these spinal nerves before. We saw C1 through C8. Those were all part of the cervical plexus and the brachial plexus. Remember that cervical plexus was C1 through C4 that innervated cervical plexus structure, things like infrahyoid muscles, um, some of these suprahyoid muscles, muscles around the neck and skin across the neck, that transverse cervical and that supraclavicular nerve, C2, C3, C4, as you wipe your hands across the front of your neck and across your clavicle right now, that's C2, C3, C4 that are coming from those cervical nerves. Keep in mind that there are eight cervical spinal nerves, even though there are only seven cervical vertebrae. The reason for that is that at C1 spinal nerve exits above the C1 vertebra. So in between the occiput and C1 segment is going to be C1 nerve root. That means that C2 nerve root exits below C1 segment or above the C2 segment. that only happens in the cervical spine. When we get down to the thoracic spine, the nerve, the spinal nerve segment exits below the vertebral segment for which it is named. So in the thoracic, lumbar, and sacral regions, the spinal nerve segment exits below the vertebral segment for which it is named. So let's look at this T1 vertebral segment. In between T1 and T2, there's an intervertebral foramen created by the intervertebral notch, or by the vertebral notch in each of those segments. That little gap creates the intervertebral foramen. Through that intervertebral foramen between T1 and T2 is going to be the T1 nerve. There are 12 pairs of thoracic spinal nerves, T1 through T12. The, the T2, or second intercostal nerve, we mentioned in the last um, couple of weeks is the intercostal brachial nerve. That's a little bit different than the rest of those T1 through T12 spinal nerves. It's different because there's no anterior and posterior branch split. 
And it's different because it pierces through the external intercostal, pierces through the serratus anterior, crosses the axilla, joins with the medial brachial cutaneous nerve, and communicates with the radial nerve. And that is the anatomical explanation for referred cardiac pain in the left arm for individuals suffering from a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. In the lumbar spine, we've got L1 through L5 spinal nerve roots. In Quick the question about yeah. the hard attack thing. So why is it that that's yeah. only a sign in males and not women? Um, that's a really good question. That I don't have an anatomical explanation for. Okay. Other than... Um, because the anatomy of the T2 nerve root is the same in both males and females, but what is significantly different between males and females are uh, the pathways of pain perception and pain modulators. Hey, Dr. Farr, I can chime in on that. Um, I would love that. So, I don't know, my background is a paramedic. Um, so it's not an always or never type of thing. It's just a less common in females. Just I just want to make sure that's clear. It's not that females yeah. ever never have pain with it with a myocardial infarction. It's just uh, it's just a lot less incidence of it. Correct. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Um, because it's anatomy and. If there's one thing that I say over and over and over again, it's that anatomy is like this, except when it's not. So you can have that left arm pain, but not even all males will experience that. It's just that more males experience that than the percentage of females. Some females will experience that pain, but not all of them. And especially with diabetics, you'll see those atypical presentations even more um, because their nerves are damaged. So you won't see that, you know, you'll see a lot more, a lot different uh, presentations of referred pain uh, when it comes to it comes to that. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, all right. So on spinal nerves, do we have any other questions on, so we've got, C1 through 8, T1 through 12, L1 through 5, S1 through 5, and then our coccygeal. Um, as long as we're on this slide, we're going to see it again. I'm just going to point out a couple of things. Um, on this slide, you can see the termination of the spinal cord. That termination of the spinal cord is the conus medullaris that occurs at the L1 or L2 vertebral level. So the spinal cord, let's palpate that. Let's find, reach around to your back, find your 12th rib, move medial to that, move one segment down to find the L1 vertebral segment. That's where your spinal cord ends. As the conus medullaris, that narrowing, that cone-shaped narrowing, but the vertebral column is a lot longer than the spinal cord. Anybody want to venture a guess as to why the vertebral column is longer than the spinal cord? Um, when you're growing your spinal cord, it gets to like full length, or not spinal cord, your vertebral column gets to full length and your spinal cord still growing or is it the opposite way around it's exactly opposite of that but i get where you're uh, headed excellent so i think we talked about this thanks connor um we i think we mentioned this in our live in-person lectures back in the day when we could see each other um, and spend time in the same room together um, but that's absolutely right when you're born your spinal cord is largely the same length it's going to be for the rest of your life. As, as you grow, as your skeleton grows and matures, that spinal cord stays the same length, but 
the vertebral column increases in length. And that's going to result in a couple different things. First of all, is that that conus medullaris, that termination of the spinal cord, is going to end at L1, maybe L2. The dura mater that is that fibrous meningeal layer helping to protect the spinal cord and the brain, that's already developed. That's, that's already picked an anchor. And that dura attaches at the S2 segment at the towards the inferior margin of this image towards the left you can see termination of dural sac at the S2 level when you were a wee little baby first coming out of the womb that dural that termination of the dural sac was in the same spot as that conus medullaris as your vertebral column lengthens, that dural sac extends all the way down to the S2 level. Even though the spinal cord ends at L1. Sweet. We're going to talk more about that. Um, You'll also notice in this image, there's a cervical enlargement and a lumbar enlargement. Somebody new who hasn't uh, spoken up in lecture yet today, anybody want to venture a guess as to why there is a cervical enlargement and a lumbar enlargement? Uh, is it because they have more gray matter? There is more gray matter. Thanks, Will. Um, why is there more gray matter at that location of the lumbar enlargement and the cervical enlargement? Uh, is that for me, too, or, or anybody? Oh, that that's for you or anybody else. Just, so it had like just fewer axons or not fewer. We've got more axons coming in. We've got more synapses. The synapses are going to occur in the gray matter. The axons are going to create white matter as they form tracks in the spinal cord and in the brain. So remember that the cervical enlargement exists because of the increased number of synapses for both sensory and motor information to the upper extremity, to and from the upper extremity. The lumbar enlargement exists because of increased number of sensory and motor nerves to and from the lower extremity. And that's it. While we're talking about the um, spinal cord and, and that, can I ask a quick question about the, um, does this, this, does the central canal of the spinal cord actually contain anything specific? Like, is it white matter or CSF or, or what's in that tiny little space? So, yeah. So that teeny tiny little space is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. It's not a whole lot of cerebral spinal fluid most just because that canal is super tiny and narrow, um, but it does contain cerebral spinal fluid. A majority of the cerebral spinal fluid is found in the subarachnoid space. And we're going to talk about that subarachnoid space in just a moment. Any other questions? All right, so let's continue our discussion of the spinal cord and associated structures. So that spinal cord is about 17, 18 inches in length. It is continuous with the brain stem. The part of the brain stem that it's continuous with, um, up towards the top there where it sort of looks like it's opening up and split open in the image there, that is the 
um, brainstem, the medulla oblongata. And um, it's going, the brainstem, the brainstem runs from the foramen magnum. That's that foramen magnum means large opening or large hole in the base of the occiput. And then it runs to about L1 or L2. It concludes as the conus medullaris. After that conus medullaris, if you move inferior or caudal, caudal meaning tail, if you move caudal to that conus medullaris at the L1 segment level, then the nerves that continue down are collectively called the cauda equina. Cauda equina means horse's tail. The cauda equina is going to be all of the nerves that exit through intervertebral foramen inferior to L1. So that collection of nerves in the central vertebral canal, in that vertebral canal, are going to be referred to as the cauda equina. That's going to include a lot of those nerves from the thoracolumbar plexus, from the lumbar plexus, the sacral plexus, and sacral coccygeal plexuses. And that, and we talked about that central canal of the spinal cord that runs through the middle of it. And yes, as Will asked, that is filled with a little bit of cerebral spinal fluid. Um, yeah. The brain and the spinal cord, as we mentioned, is surrounded by meninges. There are three meninges. The most superficial meninge is the dura mater. Dura mater means tough mother. Mater means mother, dura, like durable, meaning tough. So we have the tough mother that creates this fibrous, thick wrapping around the brain and the spinal cord. On the image right here, it's that dura mater that is reflected to expose the spinal cord. There are, it shows two little forceps peeling away the dura mater. And then what's left deep to that dura mater is going to be the arachnoid mater and then the pia mater. The dura mater, a couple things. Um, superficial to the dura mater is the epidural space. That's where injections of an epidural are going to be injected to block pain messages. That epidural space is filled mainly with fat and vessels. And it should be noted, we mentioned previously that the dura mater extends all the way down via the dural sac to the S2 segment level. Deep to that dura mater, is going to be the arachnoid mater. The arachnoid mater has a, a potential space immediately deep to it called the subarachnoid space. Let's see if I can find a different image here. So here on this image, what's in yellow around the spinal cord, that is the epidural space. We see within the dura mater, and uh, within the arachnoid mater, that space deep to the arachnoid mater is the subarachnoid space that's filled with cerebral spinal fluid. That cerebral spinal fluid is going to be important to maintaining the nutrient, uh, nutrients required for the brain and spinal cord to function, um, getting rid of metabolites as we continue um, processes and break down processes, um, and it's going to bathe the brain and the spinal cord and um, provide buoyancy, which prevents the brain and the spinal cord from hitting the cranium or the vertebral canal. Let's go back here for a moment. Um, so that was the arachnoid mater and the subarachnoid space. The deepest layer of the meninges is the pia mater. 
Pia means delicate. So we have the delicate mother. This is going to be directly adhered to the brain and the spinal cord. It's a really thin layer. It's fragile. It's more loose areolar connective tissue than it is fibrous uh, connective tissue like the dura mater was. And the pia mater creates these tiny little tooth-like ligaments that help anchor the spinal cord to the dura mater. So in the image on the right here, we have the nerves. The nerve roots are going to be the large structures that extend laterally from the spinal cord, piercing through the dura mater. The dura mater is reflected using the forceps. And the structures that you see deep to that, there are tiny little tooth-like extensions or little triangle tent-like extensions that look like they connect the spinal cord to the dura. And those exist in between the nerve roots. Those are the dentate ligaments. Those dentate ligaments or denticulate ligaments, those tooth-like extensions of the dura mater of the pia mater to the dura mater are going to help stabilize the cord to the dura. That pia mater that wraps around the spinal cord is going to continue beyond the spinal cord and beyond the dural sac. Remember the dural sac goes all the way down to S2, but the pia mater continues all the way through the dural sac and attaches to the coccyx via the phylum terminale. So that pia mater that wrapped around the spinal cord is going to continue and within the medulla or the lumen of that phylum terminale is going to be a really small amount of cerebral spinal fluid. That cerebral spinal fluid is the continuation of the central spinal canal, that little bit of cerebral spinal fluid that Will asked about just a little bit ago, that continues all the way down through that phylum terminale. That phylum terminale is an extension of the dura. It is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. It is not a nerve. It attaches to the coccyx and may be the anatomical explanation for cranial sacral therapy, where you've got an attachment from the nervous system directly to the skeletal anatomy. Let's move on to the areas of gray matter and white matter. So gray matter in the brain and the spinal cord is non-myelinated collections of cell bodies, components of cells, for example, dendrites. For, um, in the spinal cord, the gray matter is located deep. In the brain, the gray matter is located on the cortex or the surface of the brain. So gray matter, think integration and processing. So this is where we're going to relay information from one cell to another. This is where collections of cell bodies are going to be located. And in the spinal cord, we've got three areas of gray matter. We have the dorsal horn, also called the posterior horn, also called the posterior gray column. And in our image here, we've got a series of cross sections of the spinal cord in the upper row towards the left. If you look for dorsal posterior horn of gray matter, that's where you're going to have sensory information coming in from the dorsal root. Information comes in through the back. Information goes out through the front of the spinal cord. So that dorsal horn of gray matter is going to play a big role in pain and carrying information from that from different areas and levels throughout the body up to the brain. We also have the ventral horn, 
or the anterior horn of gray matter. That's going to be motor neurons in that anterior horn. Those anterior horn cells or ventral horn cells, those are going to be the motor neurons that innervate skeletal muscles. So think motor to skeletal muscles. In the lateral horn, so let's look at the T2 and T8 cross sections. That's the upper row towards the right, the T2 cross section and the T8 cross section there. What you see there is a lateral horn or intermedial lateral gray column or the lateral gray column. That all means the same thing. The lateral gray column, lateral horn, intermedial lateral nucleus, intermedial lateral gray column. All of those are preganglionic fibers of the sympathetic nervous system. The lateral horn only exists from T1 to L2 or 3 spinal cord levels. Not vertebral levels, spinal cord levels. That lateral gray column is all about autonomic nervous system. In particular, sympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic nervous system, everything exciting in life. Your heart beats faster, your respirations increase, you shunt blood away from the GI tract and move it towards skeletal muscles, towards your eyes and ears and towards your brain for fight, flight, freeze and friction response. All of those messages start in the spinal cord, those sympathetic nervous system starts in the spinal cord in the lateral gray column between the level of T1 down to L2-3. The gray matter of the brain and the spinal cord peaks in development in your 20s. After that, your brain starts a process called pruning, and we trim out information that we don't use regularly, or we forget how to do things, or our coordination and muscle memory decreases if we don't utilize those things on a regular basis. Um, after our 20s. Up until our 20s, our brains and our spinal cord are all about saving as much information and um, processing as we get. That's why it's easier to learn when we're younger. May I ask a lateral horn question? Absolutely. Um, have we ever differentiated between spinal cord level and vertebral level before? And, and if so, like, what does that mean exactly? No, I don't think we have. Um, so let's talk about the difference between vertebral level and spinal level. And to do that, let's go back to our spinal nerves slide. So if we look in the blue region here where we've got thoracic nerves, That's going to be T1 through T12. The very first one or two um, bits of the purple lumbar nerves during that lumbar enlargement is going to be including the L1, L2 nerve roots. Follow those purple nerve roots down just a little bit and see where they exit at the spinal level. Okay, so let's go back to, let's find that L1 vertebral segment. Wrap your hands around T12, uh, find that 12th rib, wrap around to the back, move one segment down. So now you're at the L1 vertebral level. Let's go up to the T12 level, and that's where that uh, lumbar enlargement or the lumbar dilation occurs. That's going to be the spinal cord level of L1, L2. 
So vertebral level T12 is going to be spinal cord level L1, L2. Keep one hand there. And then with your other hand, find the vertebral prominence, usually at C7. And drop down in between the spinous processes of C7 and T1. So you should have one hand in between the spinous processes of C7 and T1. And you should have one hand in between the spinous processes of T12 and L1. So those are vertebral levels. The spinal cord levels at, as, at those locations are going to be the T1 spinal cord level down to the L1 or L2 spinal cord level. It's between those two points that you're contacting right now that the lateral gray column exists. That is the beginning of all things exciting in the sympathetic nervous system. Does that help answer your question, Will, or do we need another example? No, that, you know, I think I just wasn't exactly putting it together. That makes a lot more sense now that I'm looking at it here and you explained it. Thank you. That's right. Perfect. If you guys have any other questions along the way, um, don't be afraid to ask. Where did we go? Here we go. All right. So that was our lateral horn. That lateral horn only exists between T1 to L2, 3 level. That's going to be slightly higher up in the vertebral column. So that's gray matter. Now let's talk about white matter. And white matter is typically going to be axons, axons and glial cells. Glial cells are these supportive cells. Neuroglia means nerve glue. Um, the axons and glial cells can be myelinated or unmyelinated. In the image here, we have a myelinated neuron. Myelinated neuron is going to be individually packaged and wrapped. An unmyelinated neuron is still going to involve Schwann cells. Schwann cells are going to create that sort of myelin sheath around the axon. Um, but unmyelinated neurons still have Schwann cells. The difference is that unmyelinated neurons are sort of bundled together to reduce the amount of individual packaging or myelination that we have to do. That's going to slow down the action potential speed in an unmyelinated neuron. And it's also going to reduce the size of the neurons. So myelinated neurons are large and thick in diameter. They send really fast messages. Unmyelinated neurons, the the bundle package neurons are going to send messages just a little bit slower, but it's going to save on space and energy for the human body. That myelin and those myelin sheaths and the tracks that are created by those axons that are myelinated and unmyelinated, they get bundled together and they form tracks within the nervous system the central nervous system. Those tracks appear as white matter. So in these cross sections of C5, T2, T8, L1, L2, S2, S3, the areas of white matter around there are either going to be tracks that are carrying information up towards the brain, called sensory or ascending or afferent tracks, or those areas of white matter are going to send messages from the brain down through the spinal cord out to the effector organs. Those are effector or motor output or descending tracks. And again, the organization of white matter in the spinal cord compared to the brain is that gray matter in the spinal cord is located centrally. White matter is located peripherally in the spinal cord. In the brain, 
white matter and tracts are located centrally or within the medulla of the brain. And then those tracts radiate out to the gray matter. And the gray matter in the brain is where we do all of our processing and integration. And the more gray matter we have, the more processing we can do. So that's why the surface of the brain is convoluted and you've got these sulci and gyri, these crevices and these hills and valleys that increase the surface area because that surface area increases your brain's power. The more surface area you have, the more processing power you have with your brain. And let's move to a little bit more on the spinal nerve anatomy. Now, in this image here, we see the vertebral segment. That vertebral body is the largest portion of the image here on the right. We saw the conus medullaris in the middle in the white there. So we must be around maybe T1, or sorry, L1 level at this point. Surrounding that conus medullaris is going to be the little white dots. Those are the cauda equina. But let's look lateral to that and let's follow the, the nerve roots out. There's a ventral root. It, let's see. Nope, I can't highlight that right now. I'm still working on being able to annotate these in teams. And that's not a skill I've developed quite yet. Um, oh, what'd I do? Give me one second. All right, there we go. Uh, so we saw the conus medullaris. Let's look um, at the ventral root and the dorsal root ganglion. Those are labeled on the right side. The dorsal root ganglion is going to be that little dilation. Dorsal root is going to carry sensory information in. Remember, sensory information comes in through the back of the spinal cord. Motor efferent output goes out through the front. So the dorsal root and the dorsal root ganglion are going to be involved in sensory input in. The ventral root is going to be motor or efferent output going out like information, for example, to contract a muscle. It's a general somatic afferent, a GSA. That's going to travel through, no, nope, GSE, sorry, is going to go through the ventral root. Afferents are sensory, so all of the afferent sensory information is going to come in through that dorsal root. That ventral root contains motor efferent fibers with the cells located in the spinal cord. And um, between the levels of T1 to L2 or 3, and at the level of S2 through S4 ventral roots, you're going to have two different types of motor fibers. You'll have skeletal muscle uh, somatic efferents, those are voluntary, so think about contracting your bicep or contracting your tricep as you flex and extend your elbow. Those muscles contract as a result of somatic efferent voluntary motor movements traveling to those skeletal muscles via that ventral root. Ventral is motor output. At the level of T1 to L2-3 and S2 through S4, we also have autonomic output that is going to go to smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, glands, viscera, all of those are going to exit through those same ventral roots and then they're going to branch off in, in various ways and we're going to learn more about that branching um, in a little bit. Um, all of the remaining 
natural roots. So T1 through L2 or 3 and S2 through S4 contain two types of motor fibers to skeletal muscle and to viscera. If we're talking above T1 or between L3 and S2 or below S4, those nerve ventral nerve roots only contain one type of motor fiber, and that's the skeletal muscles. Let's take another look at the spinal nerve anatomy. So here on our image, the spinal nerve starts with the union of the ventral ramus and the dorsal ramus. Mute everybody else real quick. All right, there's getting some feedback. Um, so the spinal nerve is formed by the union of the ventral root and, or the anterior root and the dorsal root or the posterior root. The spinal nerve itself contains a meningeal branch. That meningeal branch is going to be near the ventral dorsal rami and it's going to um, give off rami communicantes. That's a communication between the spinal nerves and the sympathetic trunk. We'll talk more about those later on. The meningeal branch re-enters the intervertebral foramen. So in the close-up image right in the middle of this PowerPoint, you see the dilation of the dorsal root ganglion. And just left of that, there's a little branch that swoops back into the vertebral canal. That is the meningeal branch. That's going to innervate the zygopophyseal joints, the annulus fibrosis of the intervertebral disc, the ligaments of the spinal cord, the meninges, and the vessels of the cord. That meningeal branch is going to branch off of the spinal nerve and re-enter the vertebral canal. Re-enters the intervertebral foramen and then re-enters the intervertebral canal. And those are the little branches that you see turning and going back into the canal. It looks like they're branching into that fatty yellow um, epidural space. And that is true. Let's continue back to that spinal nerve. And let's continue outward. The, the two big branches, there's a dorsal ramus and a ventral ramus. Ramus is singular, rami is plural. The dorsal and ventral rami um, are going to branch off. The dorsal ramus is always going to be smaller. That's the first little branch from that spinal nerve that goes posterior and it looks like it's coming down into the screen and then it goes into that muscular tissue. That muscular tissue that's shown is the intrinsic muscles of the back. Those are like the intersegmental muscles like your spinalis, your um, paraspinal muscles, your erector spinae group, the intertransversarii, the rotatories. Those are all examples of intrinsic muscles of the back. And also the skin along the spinal, uh, or skin along the spine. Run your fingers along your spine right now on either side of that spinous process. Those muscles that you're feeling, press a little bit deeper and leave your hands in one spot. And with your hands in one spot, laterally flex and laterally rotate to one side. You feel those tiny little muscles contracting underneath there. Those are the intrinsic muscles of the back. Those are all innervated by dorsal rami. The ventral ramus is the larger, it looks like 
the main part of that nerve? And it is. There's a lot more fibers involved in that ventral ramus. Well, that ventral ramus is going to have motor and sensory fibers in it. The mixed spinal nerve or the spinal nerve has motor and sensory. Remember, we started from the dorsal root that was only sensory, the ventral root or the anterior root uh, that was only motor. We've moved out from that and now we're in the dorsal rami and the ventral rami. We've got both motor and sensory. So the ventral ramus in the central image right here is that big branch that goes left and then it just disappears to the border of the picture. That big nerve there, that is the ventral ramus. It is that ventral ramus that is going to be involved in the braiding or the plexus formation. We saw previously in this course the lumbar plexus, the cervical plexus, the brachial plexus, the sacral plexus. All of those plexuses get formed by the ventral rami. You also have autonomics running with those ventral rami. Those autonomics are going to be the um, peripheral nervous system, autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers running to the organs. So there, let's talk more about that ventral ramus or anterior ramus. So there's the anterior primary division, which is the same thing as the ventral ramus, which is the same thing as that anterior ramus. We're looking at that big branch coming out after we form the mixed spinal nerve it's the little white structure that moves laterally and looks like it meets up with a blood vessel and then it sort of disappears as it goes deep to some bones there. It looks like a rib. So we're following that anterior primary ramus and near the vertebral body, let's find the vertebral body in this image and there are two white dots on either side of the vertebral body. You see those two white dots? That is the sympathetic chain ganglia. Those sympathetic chain ganglia are going to be found all along the spinal cord, all the way to the top, all the way to the bottom. It's those sympathetic chain ganglia that allow us to get sympathetic messages out to the entire body at any level. So it's going to allow sympathetic nerve signals, fight, flight, freeze, friction, to exit the nervous system at any level, but sympathetics could only get in there between T1 and L2, 3. I'm going to switch over to a whiteboard now, and we're going to draw this out a little bit differently. So we're just switching over to whiteboard. I want to draw a picture here. All right, so let's start with the brain and the spinal cord. Can I get at least one person to confirm that you can see that on your screens? Yep. yep. Beautiful, thank you. All right, so. That spinal cord, let's talk a few details right now. That spinal cord. For, our, yeah. says, uh, for now, only members of this organization can participate. Oh, that's fascinating. 
let's see if I can. Yeah, if you're using the apps, it should automatically allow you into that space. Yeah, I'm not able to get by using the link from the email. Yeah. So if you're logged in using your student email, it should allow you. Enter in, let's see. So let's try this again. All right. So now I erase. Um, Brian, are you able to see the whiteboard now? No. All right. Um, so for those of you that can't see the whiteboard that everybody else can see, I want you to um, either visualize this in your mind or take out a piece of paper or crack out notability. And um, we're going to do Pictionary style anatomy and I'm going to tell you what to draw so that you can follow along with us. So use whatever sort of drawing utensil you have. I am creating an image that looks like the brain and the spinal cord from an A to P view. So I've got a circle at the top and I'm drawing out a long spinal cord extending inferior to that circle. I'm labeling my brain with a B so that everybody knows that that's a brain. And then the spinal cord with an SC. Once you have your brain and your spinal cord, I want you to visualize and draw a line through the spinal cord at the level of T1. Then I want you to go down to the spinal cord. I want you to draw a line through the spinal cord at the level of L2 or L3. Right now, if you're following along, I've got a circle at the top for the brain, a long spinal cord, and two lines drawn through that spinal cord labeled T1 and L2-3 at the appropriate place. In between that L, in between the T1 and the L2-3 portions of that spinal cord, I'm going to draw a little line inside the spinal cord, two lines representing the lateral gray column. That lateral gray column found between T1 and L2-3 is where the sympathetic nervous system starts. From that lateral, oh, somebody else started sharing. <laughs> I'm going to take that back. All right, can we all see my beautiful drawing here? Or the ones yeah. that could see yeah. it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we're back to T1, L2, 3. We've drawn in our lateral gray column. Um, now, in between that T1 and L2, 3, I'm going to draw a cross section of the spinal cord to just illustrate where the lateral gray column exists. So that right there is the lateral gray column. 
We're going to highlight that in green. So what I've done, uh, for those of you that are following along um, and can't see this, I've drawn a cross section of the spinal cord with the dorsal gray horn, the ventral gray horn, and the lateral gray horn. The lateral gray horn is only found between T1 and L23. Yes, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, next to the spinal cord, let's go back to our original drawing. Next to the spinal cord, I'm going to draw little circles representing sympathetic chain ganglia all along the spinal cord. So these little red circles that we're drawing all along the length of the spinal cord, and there's about 30 of them, 30 pairs of them, those represent the sympathetic chain ganglia. Now I'm going to connect all of those red dots so that all of those sympathetic chain ganglia can communicate with each other. That's going to be important. So this sympathetic firing starts in the lateral gray column. The lateral gray column only exists between T1 and L23. But we have sympathetic responses that need to get out at various levels of the spinal cord, right? So the way we get from that lateral gray column into that sympathetic chain or the sympathetic chain ganglia that are surrounding the spinal cord, we're going to exit the lateral gray column. We're going to get into the sympathetic chain. You go into the sympathetic chain via white rami communicantes. White rami communicantes are going to be your the pathway of sympathetic neurons that start in that lateral gray column to get into the sympathetic chain. From there, the sympathetic nerves can go up and go above that T1 level, or they can go below the L2, L3 level. That's how we're going to get sympathetic nerve firing and signals to areas of the body that are outside of the T1 to L2, 3 area. So we get into this sort of sympathetic escalator or elevator via white rami communicantes. But then when we want to leave the sympathetic chain ganglia, let's say at the level of C8, we get out of that sympathetic chain. You go out. via gray rami communicantes. We've seen the white rami and gray rami communicantes before. Now that I've drawn that image, I'm going to switch back over to our PowerPoint. Oh, let's see. No, sorry, figuring this out still. 
What's that Epsilon arrow for? Um, that Epsilon arrow, so the abbreviation for sympathetic is the Greek letter Epsilon. Cool. So any, anytime you see Epsilon, that's exciting. That means sympathetic. Parasympathetic is usually abbreviated as P Epsilon. So sympathetic is Epsilon, parasympathetic is P Epsilon. Good question. We're going to reopen this. Hmm. This PowerPoint. Yeah. To when you say Yeah. Yep. Moves faster. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. Okay. We should be back to our neurology PowerPoint now. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we talked about that ventral ramus. So remember those, those little sympathetic chain ganglia, the epsilon chain ganglia that we just drew out on the whiteboard? Those are these little white dots on either side of the vertebral body. Also called paravertebral ganglia. Um, you see the two little branches or two little white tendrils that extend from the mixed spinal nerve up towards that sympathetic chain ganglion? Those are the rami communicantes. So the rami, there are two types of rami communicantes. There's a white and a gray. White rami communicantes are how we get from the spinal cord into the sympathetic chain ganglia. So the white rami are gonna be your pathway from this mixed spinal nerve for autonomics, sympathetics, sympathetic autonomics, into the sympathetic chain ganglia and then to get out of that sympathetic chain, we exit via the gray rami communicantes. So you remember when we had our drawing of the spinal cord and that lateral gray column for the preganglionic sympathetics only existed between T1 to L2-3? There are white rami communicantes that are sort of like the access route to get out of the spinal cord into the sympathetic chain ganglia. From there, we can go up and down the spinal cord with those exciting sympathetic messages, and we can exit the spinal, so we, we can exit the uh, sympathetic chain at any level. If gray rami communicantes are the way that we get out of the sympathetic chain ganglia, 
then gray rami must exist at all spinal levels. White rami, remember, was our onboarding. Those only exist, white rami only exist between T1 and L2-3. Oh, thank you for sharing that whiteboard picture, James. We appreciate that. Uh, that's in the meeting chat. All right. So the anatomy of spinal nerves is that the spinal nerve itself contains both sensory and motor. That motor contains autonomic and somatic nerves. And uh, the, the autonomic nervous system is divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. Questions so far on spinal anatomy? If you go back one slide, um, just that picture of the whole shebang. Yeah. So coming down is that dorsal, oh, nope, is the ventral rami, but that first branch that kind of goes up towards the sympathetic chain ganglia. Yeah. So is that what the what like the WRC is, is that tiny little guy? Yeah. So if we can, if we can all pinpoint that sympathetic ganglion, that's the two little white dots on either side of the vertebral body. There are two white little tendrils connecting the mixed spinal nerve to that sympathetic ganglion. So that sympathetic ganglion on either side of the vertebral body and the two little tendrils, those branches coming up from the mixed spinal nerve, those are the white and gray rami communicantes or the WRC and the GRC, gray rami communicantes and white rami communicantes. The white ramus is actually the more lateral of the two and the gray ramus is the more medial of the two rami communicantes attaching or connecting the ventral ramus to the sympathetic ganglion. So that one right along the vertebral body is the meningeal branch though, right? It's not either one of those uh, communicantes? Correct. So okay. um, medial or proximal to the branching of those rami communicantes, they go up into that sympathetic ganglion. Those, they look like recurrent branches. They branch off, they go back in the same hole that they came out of, and then they spread into the uh, vertebral column. Those are the meningeal branches. Does that make sense? Clear as mud. Beautiful. All right. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can. Mm. Give me just a second here. I'm trying to find a PowerPoint document for, oh, there it shows up. Okay. Um, let's see if I can share a different document now. I don't think I'm going to be able to. All right. So, um, we're going to switch to a screen share.
then we're going to go through the autonomic nervous system. So we introduced the autonomic nervous system in the last presentation. This should all be reviewed that the nervous system is divided into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Peripheral nervous system is further divided into motor and sensory or efferent and afferent or output and input. For that motor peripheral nervous system output, we're following down to the autonomic branch. So peripheral nervous system, motor output, autonomics, we're talking to the viscera, so visceral motor peripheral nervous system is divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. The involuntary or autonomic nervous system innervates the viscera. The nerve, the neuron type is general visceral efferent or GVE neurons. GVEs are going to innervate smooth muscle, glands, and internal organs. As we mentioned previously, the autonomic nervous system or the ANS is further divided into the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, and the enteric nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is a two nerve cell pathway with a preganglionic fiber, which originates in the central nervous system, and a postganglionic or postsynaptic fiber that exists in the peripheral nervous system. The organization of the autonomic nervous system is divided based on where are the preganglionic fibers originate or exit the central nervous system. The divisions of sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions are described as cervical sacral outflow for the parasympathetic. So cervical and sacral outflow is parasympathetic. So the parasympathetic nervous system involves cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10. 3, 7, 9, and 10. The parasympathetic nervous system also contains the S2 through S4 nerve roots. So cervical and sacral outflow or cranial sacral outflow describes parasympathetic innervation, the rest, digest, arousal, repair, cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, 10, and S2 through S4. S2 through S4 are going to innervate the descending colon, anus, urinary, um, and reproductive organs, some pelvic organs cranial sacral outflow 379 let's start 3 7 9 10 and s2 through s4 are part of the rest digest repair arousal parasympathetic division the sympathetic division as we previously discussed has a thoracic outflow or thoracolumbar outflow because those sympathetics all start, the preganglionic sympathetics start between the T1 and L2-3 in that lateral gray column. So let's take a look at a really rudimentary example of parasympathetic and sympathetic dysfunction. Possibly. This is a clinical case that I had a couple of years ago. And um, I had a seven year old male patient with a three month history of nocturnal enuresis that happened daily for over three months. Nocturnal enuresis is bedwetting. And to go along with this, the 
patient had behavioral problems in school. They were seeing a therapist for one month, um, but they were still having bedwetting, as the mother described it, copious amounts, a lot of volume every single night for over three months. Um, so the mother is a patient of mine. And as I was working with the mother one day, she is explaining, she's talking about her kids and how her son has been having these behavioral issues. He's been bedwetting every single night. She's had to change the sheets every single night. She's put a shower curtain on his bed uh, to help reduce the time involved in cleaning up. And so he explained to her that there are some anecdotes that adjusting the spine may impact nocturnal enuresis. Now towards the, um, on the next page of this document, there's a link to an article on research for spinal manipulation and um, nocturnal enuresis. It turns out that the, the research is all anecdotal right now. It might help, it might not. But I explained to her the anatomy behind it. And um, I asked her if she would let me treat her son uh, the next time I see her, which was a week later. So I, I get the history from the mom. I do an exam on the seven-year-old male patient He's got a C1, it's posterior right rotation restriction, left rotation restriction. It's just posterior all the way. It doesn't slide anterior and it's fixed. And C7 through T10, the vertebral segments are flexed and they don't move into extension. The sacrum is flexed or nutated. Nutated means to nod. So it's tilted forward and the SI is fixed bilaterally a week prior, because of the nocturnal enuresis, uh, the boy had a urinary analysis done, and everything on the urinary analysis was normal. So just based on what I know about spinal anatomy and sympathetic and parasympathetic functioning, I told the mom, like, I would like to adjust your son, and it might help, it might not, but let's just try it out and see what happens. So I treated these segments using diversified technique. I treated them one time a week for three weeks and I reevaluated at each visit. That's not a picture of the student or the patient. That's a free image grab from the internet. So after the first week, I actually texted the mom a couple days after and I said, how are things going? Fill me in. She said, it's been amazing. I've had five or six dry nights. There was one wet night, third day after the first adjustment. And I said, you know, um, just because of what I know about sympathetic and parasympathetic functioning and how that can affect behavior, um, let me just check in. How is his mood and behavior doing? He seems to be doing generally better. Now we're at a junction point. Is the treatment that I offered and did related to the outcomes that we're seeing in this patient? That's an open question. I would say yes. Okay. Um, and that's just based on, for me, and this is kind of awkward to admit, but I, I had something like this go on uh, around that age as well for probably a longer period of time than this. Yeah. Um, and it was, to me, it felt completely uncontrollable. So anything that you did that gave six dry nights in a row, that's gigantic, uh, in my opinion, would just be, it's it's like moving a mountain almost. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So, um, and I was under the same sort of perception. I mean, there were there were no dietary changes to the patient. The patient was already seeing a therapist. 
the patient had already taken a urinary analysis. Now, it is completely possible that the therapy and the urinary analysis had something to do with the change in symptoms, except that they were already doing those things and still experiencing symptoms. So I continue along my course of treatment. Um, I adjust a lot of the the same areas. I do a reevaluation. I adjust the same areas. And three days post visit two, the patient has not had any wet nights. Um, now, this has been about a year and a half now. Um, I saw the patient, treated the patient three times, and the patient has not had any wet nights since then. So now my next question is, is that scientific evidence that a chiropractic spinal manipulative therapy treated nocturnal enuresis? No. I would say not. I would say no. There's no oh. negative control. Correct. Too many well, variables happening. Right. So we've got a lot of, a lot of variables. Now, this is clinically important, especially to the patient and to the patient's mom. And to her, she didn't need to see any other additional proof. The anecdotal evidence from this one case was enough to convince that one patient and that one mother that what we did in that treatment had an impact. Now, that's a really great place to start for scientific research. Now, if I can have a couple of other patients present with nocturnal enuresis and I can treat them the exact same way, I can adjust the same segments and then I follow them afterwards. Then after I do that a hundred times, 500 times, a thousand times to a thousand different patients with the same condition, then I no longer have anecdotal evidence and I have observational data. And now I can look at that and I can start to design a randomized control trial. So now I get a whole bunch of seven-year-old patients sign up for this randomized control trial. And some of them are going to have um, the treatment and some of them are not going to have the treatment. And after a few weeks, we're going to compare the outcomes. We're going to control for all of those variables. We're going to control for the age variation, the gender variation, the dietary changes and restrictions. We're going to account for all of those other variables that we haven't planned for. And we're going to see, was it that chiropractic adjustment that changed the symptomology or was it something else? If it was the chiropractic adjustment, did it work for every single patient with nocturnal enuresis? Or did it work some of the time? And that's the beginning of science. So now how do we relate that to anatomy is if we look back at that C1, T2 through, uh, or C7 through T10, the uh, flexed ilium or the flex sacrum, the bilateral fixation of the SI joint, what would be the anatomical explanation for changes to that urinary bladder? The anatomical explanation is the innervation of sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation to the urinary bladder. So on this slide that we see right now, we have the urinary bladder here and it gets parasympathetic innervation from S2 through S4. Did we adjust the sacrum in this patient? Absolutely, we did. We also get sympathetic innervation to that urinary bladder. That sympathetic innervation is going to come from T1 to L2, 3, and then it's going to branch through the splanchnic nerves. We're going to talk about splanchnic nerves, but would there be a at least an anatomical explanation for maybe why this patient's outcome changed with adjusting the thoracic spine, the upper cervical spine where that C3, C7, C9, C10 cranial nerves exit, 
in that upper cervical region, that thoracic region for the sympathetics, and the sacral region for the parasympathetics. Is there an anatomical explanation for that? I think there's an anatomical explanation, but if we don't take really good records and if we don't continue to publish those individual case studies to drive research later on, we're always going to be stuck in this state of anecdotal evidence. And insurance isn't going to cover treatment for bedwetting, even though we have a lot of these anecdotes that say it's probably helpful. So what we need to do is take really good records and collect all of that information on similar therapies for similar conditions and publish that work. So the link that you see over to the left on the screen right now is therapies for nocturnal enuresis. In your own time, if you click on that and you look, does chiropractic spinal manipulative therapy work for nocturnal enuresis? And right now, the evidence says maybe. But to each individual patient that it does work for, that is incredibly powerful and that is incredibly clinically relevant. We just need to continue to study that so we can better understand the most effective therapies for visceral issues like nocturnal enuresis. So let's talk about... Yeah, thank you guys. So um, I think I think that's an important point to make and to inspire you to want to learn more. Um, but it's also a, a cautionary tale that I can't go around and say I can treat bedwetting, I can cure bedwetting in all seven-year-olds because that's not the case, right? that would be a misrepresentation of the scientific data that is currently available. But what I can do is that I can publish that and I can collect other cases like that so that I can say without a doubt, or not even without a doubt, I can say I'm 95% certain. I've got a 95% confidence interval that says the outcomes that I'm seeing are a result of that spinal manipulative therapy and not due to any other changes that that patient was making outside of that clinical visit. It's not due to the urinary analysis. It's not due to the therapy. It's not due to um, dietary changes or seasonal changes. And those are the kinds of things that I need. And that is the theory, the philosophy of chiropractic is to continuously find out more. Okay, enough on my, so, yeah. Absolutely. PubMed, Cochrane Review, um, any of the librarians would be more than willing to help you look. Yeah, 100%. Um, there are a couple of groups on Facebook, and um, there are groups like Forward Thinking Chiropractic Association, um, Evidence-Based Chiropractors are two Facebook groups that I belong to. Um, as a warning, there are some people in there that I don't think communicate effectively online all the time. Right? Yeah. Um, so take that with a grain of salt, but they're really great places to start conversations. And if you just don't know where to look, those groups have search functions so that you can look back at all the articles that people have shared before on research and publications or questions that they've had. But if you don't find something, those groups are also really great to um, start 
a or to post a question and say, hey, um, does anybody have any research or any clinical experience on like nocturnal enuresis or um, what else, like indigestion or fertility in females? And those people love sharing everything that they know. And those <laughs> Um, evidence-based chiropractors or evid evidence-based chiropractic. There's a, there's a sort of like nationwide evidence-based chiropractors. And then there's an evidence-based, uh, group from Northwestern as well. So you can check out those. All right. Um, we're just about out of time today. Um, I, what I might do is record the rest of parasympathetic and sympathetic, the rest of the autonomic nervous system, and I'll post the recordings on Moodle. I think I've already opened up the previous lecture recordings on autonomic nervous system and reflexes and arcs. Um, we're going to finish everything that we can next week in lecture. And whatever we get through next week in lecture and whatever's in the online Moodle course to work at your own pace, um, that's what's going to be on the final. Sound good? Did you get a chance to post that stuff you want us to do for lab this week? Not yet, but you guys don't have lab until one, so I'm going to scurry and uh, try and get that thrown together real quick. There will be a lot of like self-palpating and moving things around, and then there is the video of the virtual lab dissection in Moodle that I want you to follow along with and be familiar with. Um, I think... What is going to happen with the final exam? It'll be all multiple choice. It'll be a combination of images and um, so like identification images and multiple choice text questions. Will the question count be a lot higher than your typical exam then? Um, I'm hoping to keep the number of questions reasonable. I would like to keep it around 75 with most of that information coming from this last block of information. Nerve, central yeah. nervous system, brain autonomic nervous system and reflexes. So just to be we'll clear, see. it's just going to be one exam for the final. It's not going to be a separate lab and uh, lecture final. Yeah, it will be. It will be one exam. I'm willing to make that jump and make that commitment. Um, so a couple of those questions, what they might look like is you'll see an image with an arrow pointing to it in ExamSoft. And the first question will say, identify the structure. And then the follow-up questions will say, will have some sort of clinical relationship or um, a lecture format question about it. Does that make sense? Like an essay format question? Um, I think essay is a little bit too long. At most, maybe a couple fill in the blanks. I'm going to try and keep most of them to multiple choice. So for example, you might see a picture of the bicep brachii and an arrow pointing to it. 
to like the long head, for example, and the first question will say, um, what identify the structure and you'll put long head of bicep brachii. And then the next question will say, uh, what nerve innervates this muscle? And you'll put musculocutaneous nerve. And then the next question will say, what nerve segments make up the innervation to this muscle? And you'll put C567, make up the nerves of musculocutaneous nerve. That makes sense? Yep. Sweet. As far right. as the rest of this lecture then, um, is it, are we kind of responsible for the rest of this before next week then? Um, we're going to pick up here next week at parasympathetic division. Oh, cool. Okay. But I'm also going to open up the previous lecture recordings. So if you want to get a head start on it, cool. And then one last question. Um, so some of us typically would have lab at one and some at three. Are we doing any live stuff for that or is it just sort of the Moodle content? The, um, because I already created the video, um, you can do lab this week on your own time. We don't have to necessarily meet at one o'clock or three o'clock. Uh, because we're doing virtual dissection. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions before I let you guys out of here? Um, just one quick one. Uh, will you be like monitoring the meeting chat, or uh, should we go on email during l the lab in case we have questions? Um, I will. I'll monitor, I mean, I'm at my computer. Um, I'll be able to monitor either Teams or um, you can email me, whatever you want. I'll be here. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I'll send out your at-home lab instructions um, prior to 1 o'clock, and um, have fun doing your lab at home this week, and I'll see you no later than next Monday for lecture. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Dr. Farrar, I just have one quick question. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any idea when our exams are going to be finished grading? Yeah. I'm going to try and get those done today and get okay. those released for you. So thank you. It's, it's a lot more writing than I'm used to reading. <laughs> so, um, but there will be there'll be a gentle curve to it as well. We'll, we'll flatten that curve. So thank you for checking. Thank you for allowing me a, an extended period of time to get those back to you. Thanks for grading them. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. You're wonderful. Bye. Bye, everyone. That's B. <laughs>